Okay, let's continue our discussion of reproductive terminology. We're going to do a quick review of the flower. And remember the flower is the reproductive part of the plant and it's a shoot, it's a modified shoot. It's determinant in that it ceases growth. So it does not grow indefinitely. It grows through a certain number of nodes and internodes. Those are the sepals and the petals, the andresium and the gynesium. And then it stops growing. It stops growing right after producing the reproductive parts, the stamens, which are the male parts, and the carpels, which are the female parts. As I've already said, they can have those outer modified leaves around it which are the sepals and petals and those are called the perianth. So we've already seen those parts of the flower here. We'll just label them again really quickly. We had the receptacle at the base here's the sepal and more than one would be sepals. Here are the petals. And more than one would be petals, not just petal. And those are the perianth, which means around the flower. And then we have the male parts next. And so we have two parts to the male parts. We have the anther and the filament. And those are the stamen all together. And then if we look at the name for all of the stamen together, it could be stamens, but we don't usually say that. We usually say it's the house of the man, the andresium. Andros man, esium, house, the house of the man. On the female side, we have the house of the female, the gynesium. Gyno, female, esium, house. And there's those three parts to it. The stigma, which means the spot, the style, and the ovary. Inside the ovary, we have the ovules. And we know that the ovary is going to become the fruit. It's going to become the fruit. And the ovules are going to become the seeds. So in maturity, they're going to be the fruit and the seeds. So those are the main parts of the flower. Let's go on and look at some of the other terminologies that are associated with this. Now we're not going to worry about these two diagrams up here, just whether they have a little stalk under the flower or whether they don't. We're not going to see those terms very much in this class. The well, flower composition we do want to think about. Flower composition can be complete, that is all the parts are present, or it can be incomplete, and that means that something is absent. And now incomplete flower would be the sepals or the petals absent. So these terms, complete versus incomplete, are referring to the perianth. The terms on the other side, on the left side, are going to refer to the sexuality of the flowers. That's why it says flower sex up here. And the flower we drew in the last diagram, in the last slide, was a flower that had both male and female. So there's the male and the female, both are on the same flower, and so we say that's a perfect flower or a bisexual flower. Now we can also have uni, meaning one, sexual flowers, unisexual flowers, and those can be, if they have only stamens, only the male side, staminate, and if they're on the female side, there's that term pistil again, we say that they're pistillate. So that now we have the 
how the flowers are arranged. So they're either perfect, staminate, or pistillate. However, we can also talk about the sex of the plant, not just the sex of the flowers. So these flowers can be arranged onto the plant in different ways. If we have bisexual flowers, we say that the plant is sinecious. And that doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of the roots. Sin is with her together, Ishus is house. So with together, house, well, anyway, it means that there are bisexual flowers there. If the flowers are unisexual, there's two possibilities now. They can be monoecious, where on the same plant, what they mean by on the same plant here is that male and female are on the same plant. Mono, one, Isha's house. One plant, two different sexes of flowers. Or we can have die, two, Isha's, two houses. So in this case, the male and the female are on different plants. So the difference here is monoecious, we have unisexual flowers, but they're on the same plant, dioecious, unisexual flowers, but they're on different plants. The symmetry of the flowers. We have lots of different symmetries. The most common one is this one, which is called radio or actinomorphic. And in that case, we have multiple planes of symmetry. Three are shown here. There can be more than three planes of symmetry, lots of planes of symmetry. This. If we have two planes of symmetry, bi, again, is means two, and radial, two radii, so that a biradial flower has two planes of symmetry like this. A bilateral flower, or zygomorphic, is also called, has one plane of symmetry. So there's a mirror imaging Just going to write mirror images on both halves of the flower. And an asymmetric flower is no plane of symmetry. Okay, so there's no plane of symmetry there. It's just a weird flower. There's a few of flowers that are like that. Some of the flowers I study are like that. The number of whorls within a perianth can vary. And we're really not going to worry about this very much in this, in this class. You'll see some of these things when we talk about the different groups of plants. But for now, let's just say we're not going to worry about these terms right now. Again, I'm trying to give you a guide to which terms are more likely to see and which ones you won't. The most important thing on this slide are the two prefixes. The prefix apo and the prefix sin. Now sin I think we've already done. It means with or together. And it's indicating that there's a fusion. So in this context of talking about perianth fusion, sin means fused. So with or together, fused here. So if we said that something was sin sepalist, that means fused sepals. Sympetalous, the difference is the sim and the sin mean the same thing. They're just a difference in Greek, how, um, how the words are combined in Greek. The meaning's the same. So sympetalous is fused petals. Apo means off or away from, and it's this context that means not fused or free. So something which is apocepalous would have free petals. And so you can figure out all the other terms here all these other floral forms if you just know those two roots. And those two roots will occur in other kinds of contexts, especially the word sim or sin. That will occur quite frequently. April is not quite as frequent, but you will see it in other contexts. 
In the andresium, we already know the most important things here. We know that there is a filament and an anther, and that together those form the stamen. There are sometimes other structures. Right now we're not going to worry about them. Sometimes the filament can be other kinds of shapes. Here is it very petal-like. And sometimes the whole anther can be sterilized. in the place of a stamen. So don't worry about these other these staminodia too much or an antherode. Uh, just they're sterile structures that sometimes occur in the place of a stamen. There's a another term here we're going to need pretty soon. We might as well do it. A theci. Um, it's theca is plural, is singular. The key is plural, and it means um, a cell, like a cell meaning like a space, a small space, a cell, a box, a container, those kinds of ideas. A theca, or theci meaning several of them. So there are essentially two theci here, which is two areas where the pollen is going to be. Born. So the theci are the places where the pollen is born in the anther. So up here also we could say here are theci again, up here at the top of the anther. It's not the whole anther itself, but it's these two parts of the anther. We'll see those again in just a second. The stamen arrangement, what's important on these in this uh, slide is again the prefixes and the suffixes. And if you know those, you can make these make sense of these things. So di means two, tetra means four, dynamo, the old word dynamo from power generation. The word was used in that context because it means power or big or largeness. So essentially what it's saying, didynamis, means two big ones. And if we look at here, we see that there are two big stamens. Tetradynamous, four big ones, and we see here that there are four big or larger stamens. Four big ones. This is a slightly different term, didymus. It means that they're in clusters here. We're not going to worry about that. Really, I don't really care about the term so much here. If, if you know the roots, you can try to figure out what these things mean. We will see only in certain plant families that we have these kinds of didynamis or tetradynamis statements. They don't occur in very many families. But you may be responsible for one of those families. We're not going to worry about the terms on this slide, in this figure. It's really a more advanced kind of problem when we start thinking about the evolution of certain families. We see these relationships between the stamen and the petals, whether they're opposite or, al or alternate with the petals, etc. For us right now, we're not concerned about them. Again, on this slide, let's look at the roots. Those are the really important things. In means inside, and X means outside. So inserted means inside. In this case, the stamen are inside the perianth and exserted. They're outside. They're sticking out above the perianth. So the roots here are the more important things, in, in and x. We can have fusion again with these things. Here we have that term apo again, right off or away from. It indicates that the Stamens are not fused with each other. Epi means upon. Petal here, so upon the petal, the stamens are fused to the petal. Epipetalus. 
Okay, if you know the roots, you're well on the way to understanding these. Don't have to memorize them. Again, roots will tell us what's going on with these terms. Di, you know, two. Mono, you know, one. Delphus, you know, the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. Delphus means brother. So di diadelphus, I said die, but dia also means two. So diadelphus, two brothers. And so if you look at our stamens here, we have one set of stamens all fused together and a second stamen here, which is single. So those are two brothers in this case. Monodelphus, they're all fused together in one group here. There's no second group. And for right now, we're going to skip this term. We're probably going to skip it the whole semester. This is an arrangement of stamens we'll see in one genus, in one family, and perhaps you'll be doing this. This is the family that has tomato in it and the genus of tomato, the genus Solanum. But we'll just leave that for now. We said we'd come back to theca before those boxes or parts of an anther. And we can see here that we're having in an anther, so here's our anther, we have these two theca, these two boxes. And so that we say that dithecal two boxes. And those are formed in this way. Here we have a young microsporangium. So this is actually a young stamen. So they say it that way, a microsporangium is a young stamen. And so there are four microsporangia. I'm going to try to erase this. So four microsporangia. As the, as the stamen matures, two of those fuse, and so we get two theca, two boxes. Most anthers are formed in this way. They have these two theca coming from four microsporangia. Sometimes we have a single theca coming from two microsporangia. Okay, so what's important here is mainly, again, knowing the roots. If you know the roots of these terms, you can figure out a lot of this. Anther attachment varies across the angiosperms, as so many things vary across these groups. We're not going to worry about this at this stage. You probably won't even encounter this in your descriptions of families. It does typify some families of some genera, also in some families. But for us, let's just not do this, try to keep our terms as simple as possible. The way that the anthers open to shed their pollen varies. This is the most common one. But there are families like in the Ericaceae, the um, Heath family, the Blueberry family. We have these pores that open up like this. This is a common way in that family. And these other kinds of ways are op opening up. In general, don't worry. Again, we're not worried about you memorizing these terms. You're never going to see a picture like this on a exam and say, what kind of anther opening is this? In that sense, you don't have to worry about these. If you know that there are different ways that anthers open and that longitudinal is the common one, that's good. That's what we want you to know here. The way that the anther opens in the flower, that is, there's a Let's say that there are slits in the anther. Are those slits oriented toward the outside or toward the inside or toward the sides of each other? Um, is very important because it often places the 
pollen on an insect in a certain way. This is really beyond what we're going to talk about in this class, other than what I've just said, that it's an important something important to know about because of how the pollen is placed, but we can leave it aside for now on this. Also, we see the same kind of thing here. Here you can see where there is a certain kind of position of the openings of the anthers, and that allows the pollen to fall out of those anthers. And if there was a bee, there's our bee coming up, coming in, it could, the anther could drop their pollen on top of that bee. So the position of the stamens in the flower can also be quite important. Here's the same kind of thing shown over here. And there's our bee coming up to come into the flower and get the pollen deposited on it. Don't worry about terms on this. Just know that flowers have very important relationships with insects. And the position of the anthers and the way that they open can influence how the insects pick up the pollen. That's what I want you to know from this. Let's turn to the gynecium, the female part of the flower. And we can look at the different ways that the gynecium is oriented and arranged. It's a little more complex even than <clears throat> what's going on on the male side. In this case now, or next, many of these photographs, we're going to see a cross section. So if we take a section through the gynecium with, in this case, one, two, three carpels. It says there, three carpels. And then we look here, we see that here are the one, two, three carpels. Three carpels in CS cross section. Now also notice that when we say there are three carpels, there are three of other things here. I'm going to switch colors here. So when we talk about our three locules, and a locule means small space, there are three small spaces. We can see here, here is one of those small spaces. Here is one of those small enclosed spaces. Here is one of those small enclosed spaces. So there are three small enclosed spaces, three locules. Down here it says there are locules, one per carpel. So there are also three carpels, one locule per carpel. This is a situation where we have apocarpus gynecium. So the carpels are unfused. So here it is, three carpels, and we want to know the number of pistils in this case because you will often see that in keys. And in this case, when there's three unfused carpels, we have three pistils. Sin carpus ovaries. Sin are when we have fused carpels. So we can have different numbers of locules now. So here in the first case, we have three carpels and one locule. So how do we know that there are three carpels here? One, we can count the number of styles, three styles. Three carpels. Two, we can count the number of placenta, the attachment places of the ovules. So three placenta. And then if we look for the locules, there is one locule here. So in this case, our three carpels are fused together leaving only one small space in the center. Let's look over at the other side of the diagram, at the far right. Look over here, we see 
immediately looking at the cross section, we see that there are four locules, four small spaces. And we can see that there are four septa there. There's one, two, three, four, four placenta, four places where the ovules are attached. And so that also tells us there are four carpels. From the outside, we don't see any of that. We just see a single gynecium. It looks as if there's maybe nothing on the inside. In cases like this, we have to look on the inside. We'd have to cut a section with a razor blade, etc., and look on the inside to see what was in there. The third example, the one in the center, is a little bit even more confusing. They don't even show you the cross section here just a longitudinal section, but we can say, how do we know there's two carpels? And again, we look up here at the number of styles, and we see that there are three styles, and we can conclude that there's two carpels in there. And in this case, again, there's only one locule here. And so you don't see in this one even the placentas. It doesn't show you that in the cross section. We've really seen this already, determining carpal number in cases like this where we have three carpals. We can count the number of styles. Three styles. So if you've got three styles, you're pretty much guaranteed you're gonna have three carpals on the inside even though they, didn't, they don't show. In cases like this, you suspect you can't tell for sure suspect that there's one carpal because there's one style you have to verify that with a cross section so you cut a cross section and you find one locule. And that tells you that you were right. There's a single carpal there. One placenta, too. Here we have a case where, again, we've got fused carpals, and we're looking at the number of locules to tell us how many carpals there are. So we're cutting the cross sections, two locules, two carpals, five locules, five carpals in this case. Same thing with placenta there. You can count the number of placenta also. So if there's only one locule, we go back to our criterion of looking at the placenta. So here is a situation where you suspect that there's two carpals here because although there's not two completely f closed locules, there's two almost closed locules, and there are two placenta. Next case over here, we have three placenta, and even though there's one locule, we see those three attachment plates, which tells us there were three carpals. Over here, we find only one placenta. It is a really weird one because it appears to be at the top there. And so we would set one carpal, and we also see one style stigma combination. So that would be concluding that there is one carpal there. Now, this third case over here is the hardest one, and there's sometimes you have to do more detailed studies to really tell there. It's not something you're going to be asked in this class, but you should understand the basic principles. Okay, the attachment of the ovules. How are the ovules attached at, um, at the placentation, in placentation? There's basically three times we're going to talk about, and they look like this. The most common one is axial. So we'll see those in lab and we'll see quite a few things that have axial placentation. So there's the 
axis. It says column here, which should just really say axis. So there is the central axis, and the ovules are attached there. There's lots of variations of marginal. The second one we're going to call marginal. I think the easiest one is up here, where we see that the ovules are attached out here at the margins. And then there's variations on that. And some things don't fit very well in our very simple system, like this lamellar form. Really just don't worry about that. It's not that common. Free central, you can see that the there is an axis at the center. And that axis is not attached to any of the sides. In axial placentation over here, the axis is attached to the sides of the ovary. In free central over here, the axis is not attached to the sides of the ovary. Those are the ones that we're going to be looking at in lab, and those are the ones we're concerned with, the axial, marginal, and free central. And these we won't be seeing this semester, and let's just not worry about them too much. They're much less common. The position of the style, again, varies all kinds of ways. The most common one, most of the plants have this terminal attachment of the style. This one is in one family, the mint family. Many of our aromatic herbs that are used in cooking come in the mint family. This is the Lamiaceae. And if you're doing that family, you'll see that gyno basic. So you can see the female basic or at the base of the female, and you can see how the style comes down here and is attached at the base of the female part of the flower. So terminal and gyno basic, a few things have lateral. Uh, again, I'm not going to ask you on a quiz or anything to identify these, but you should know, especially if you end up with doing Lamiaceae, that there is this unusual kind of style attachment that characterizes the family. The arrangement of the flower parts, relationship to the ovary. So there's a bunch of terms here, and we are going to learn most of them except this one. So the first characteristic here that we can look at is the position of the ovary. So the ovary, let's put the ovary in red, since that's the color I've got here. You can see that the ovary is attached above the other flower parts. Superior ovary. Looking over here, we can see again that the ovary is attached above the other flower parts. There's another weird thing there we will come back to, but it's attached above. So ovary above. Over here, ovary inferior, the ovary is attached below the flower parts. Flower parts come off above it. Same thing here, flower parts come above it. So ovary below is the inferior ovary. So those are the two basic uh, ovary positions, superior or inferior. There are conditions where it's ha an ovary can be half inferior, where the flower parts are called kind of halfway off. That is, they become free halfway above the ovary. They're attached to the ovary part way up, but not the whole way. For right now, we can leave that aside. Now we want to look at these other terms, which these terms refer to the flower parts in relationship to the ovary. So what do I mean by that? Hypo means below, and gynus, you know, is female. So below the female, so we can see that the flower parts here come off below the female. Let me switch colors here, and look here. The flower parts are attached below the ovary. So I should really do blue down here, below the female. 
if we look over here at epigynous, epi means above, gynous female, above the female, here are the flower parts, they're becoming free above the ovary. So epigynous or epigynous, we really say, I've been emphasizing the two roots by saying epigynous. But when we say this in a more natural way, we say epigynous. So the epigynous ovary is, or the epigynous flower, rather, the epigynous flower has an inferior ovary. The hypogynous, that's how we say that word, hypogynous flower, has a superior ovary. That leaves us with these two weird cases over here. We're just not going to worry about it too much. We've seen that the ovary is inferior, but that's all we need to do. This case of perigenous, we're going to, we are going to consider. Peri means around, and gynus female, so around the female. And if we look at the position of the flower parts, we see that they are born partway up the ovary. Now, they're not fused to the ovary. The ovary is still superior, but the flower parts are not free. They don't become free from each other below the ovary. They don't become free because there is this new structure, this new structure we're just introducing now, the hypantheum. Hypo, again, this it's got an A connecting there, which I'll explain in a second. But that HYP means, again, below. We saw it over here. Anthium is another word for the flower. So below the flower, hypanthium. So there is a tissue here. And let me get a highlighter. And I will try to get a green highlighter. So there is that structure of the flower. That is the hypanthium, a floral tissue that occurs below the flower, but does not divide it up into parts. Now, understanding the hypanthium is a bit tricky. Let's look at a picture here. Oops, I'm sorry. Let me get my felt tip pen back and a color you can see. And if we look here, we can see up here there are sepals and petals and then stamen and then the gynesium, the female part of the flower. But those all become free well, except the gynesium, which is superior. Let me write that down, superior ovary. All those other flower parts become free, kind of around the gynesium. And so we have this tissue here that is the hypanthium. So there's the hypanthium. Hope it makes a little bit more sense now you can see it. This flower is um, a, a, in the genus Prunus. And that is the Prunus, um, one of the, th yeah, I can't think of the common name as Prunus actually. Um, I like a cherry, a flowering cherry would be an example. Floral diagrams, we are not going to work with too much in this course. I'm going to ask you to review them in Simpson, and uh, they're just uh, diagrammatic ways of showing the different parts of the flower and the fusing parts of the flower, and you will see them used in Simpson. We're not going to use them that much. We'll talk about floral formulas. Uh, floral formulas, not drawings, but little written formulas that describe the flower. We'll talk more about those in lab. 
Okay, we've talked about the flowers now, and we can see in many plants that the flowers are arranged into clusters. A flower cluster is called an inflorescence. So we're going to look at the f structure of inflorescences very briefly. Um, we're going to do inflorescences and then fruit structure. They're both very complex subjects, especially inflorescence structure, and we're not going to do justice to them, but we're going to give you a very brief introduction to this inflorescence or the flower cluster. An inflorescence is just a branch, and a branch system means that it's not just a single stick, it's a branched branch system. It's got a lot of branching in it, and this was originally written in German, so it's a little bit of a funny formulation here, a branch system that serves the formation of flowers. So what that means is that it bears flowers, a branch system that bears flowers. A flower cluster is a fine definition for what we want here. There's two basic par positions where we could say these flower clusters develop. They can be terminal, they can develop at the very tips of stems, like an apical bud, when we're studying those winter apical buds, or they can be axillary, like an axillary bud, when we're studying the winter buds. So flower clusters can occur in either kind of position. So we'll look at some of the basic ones. It's not really necessary to memorize a lot of these terms, I would like you to understand the very basics of the branching structure, and I'll try to keep that simple. This simple kind of branching structure we're talking here, this is a case where we have a terminal flower, and after that terminal flower, new flowers develop in the axles of leaves. And I put the leaves in parentheses there because in when we're in inflorescences, in these reproductive structures, we call those leaves bracts. So a bract is just a leaf or a leaf-like organ that doesn't that occurs in an inflorescence. So an, a bract is like a leaf, but it occurs in an in, inflorescence. It doesn't look like a leaf, but it's in the position of a leaf. So here we have the terminal growth, the terminal stem coming up, and this then is the flower. So there's our flower. And in this case, this type of branching, you see it's dichasium, di meaning two. So at each node, we're gonna have two leaves, and there's gonna be a axis that comes up and ends in a flower. Second leaf, axis that comes up and ends in a flower. On each of those, we would find two leaves, an axis would come up and end in a flower. Axis would come up and end in a flower. And that just continues. And that's what we're seeing here, what they're calling a compound dichasium. It just continues on and on and on. And this one, just don't worry about it all. So that's what I want you to understand, that basic branching pattern. Up, end in a flower, branches off to the side. There's variations on that. One of them is called a monocasium. Mono, of course, means one. And so what happens in a monocasium is just that some of those branches don't develop, and we have this kind of thing developing. That is, really, at each node, we have, a, here's our first axis flower, and now we have one leaf at that node, not two, and so there's one axis, one flower, one leaf, one axis, one flower, and that just continues like that, monocasium. Same basic branching pattern, just happens on one side. Here's another type of one, inflorescence, and these are called indeterminate, so this means that they're not, there's no terminal flower. You notice in those last ones, each axis ends in a single flower. 
So in an indeterminate inflorescence, there is no no set number of flowers per axis because there's no terminal flower. So there's various ways that this can work, but the basic idea is you have a axis and then you have bracts and flowers in the axle of each of those bracts. Here's the same thing, just the bracts in this case are opposite each other. Here's the same thing again, except in this case there's a little stem. There's a little stem that comes up in the axle of each bract. bract little stem, flower. In the first case there was no stem. The stem is called a pedicel, means a little foot, a little branching underneath it. These are essentially the same. Now they're given different names. I'm really more concerned that you understand that this is a different form of branching than the first example we looked at. The same kind of branching that we talked about last time here it is in more detail or not more detail but where there's more growth of that axis so there's that lateral axis now it gets very long there's a terminal flower new bract pedicel very long terminal flower and this can produce a flat topped or a round topped inflorescence we find these often in the things like the queen anne's lace the family apace called a quorum, but again, just understand it's that basic kind of in branching. And now we have cases where there are kind of compounds of, of those two types of inflorescences, right? We saw in these cases like the last one, like the quorum, a long axis, it ends in a flower. And remember, in those kinds of cases, we can have a lateral bract and another axis ending in a flower. And that's all that's happening here. Long axis ends in a flower lateral bract, long axis, ends in a flower, lateral bract, long axis, ends in a flower, etc. And that can continue on. Compound branching. And it gets more and more complex. A panicle is just a more complex example of that kind of thing. Don't worry again about the terms right now. Understand the basic idea that we have an indeterminate inflorescence here. They get, they get more complex. Um, Again, you'll see these different types of inflorescences sometimes in the families. Again, this is the mint family, Lamiaceae, and if you're going to have the mint family, if you end up with that one, you will see that there are clusters of flowers like this at the nose, big clusters of flowers. Again, don't worry about the term, but you can see the variations here. Again, no, don't worry about the term so much here, but here we have the sunflower family, that is the Asteraceae, and there are heads of flowers. So this is a compound inflorescence. That thing there, that I just put the arrow to, this thing here, those are actually inflorescences. And so this, in this family, we have an inflorescence, that thing, made up of inflorescences and the little inflorescences look like flowers. We'll talk more about that when we get to the Asteraceae. Really interesting family. And now there's specialized types of inflorescences. So um, we'll just leave these basically to we get to the families. I'll mention some of the family names here. This is in um, Phagaceae, the family of the oaks and a number of other ones, but that's a prominent one. This is in the family of, near the end of the semester, the um, Eraceae, no, not um, Ericaceae, the Jack in the Pulpit family. And this one is of Fig, it's the um, Moraceae, and specifically in the genus Ficus, the Fig family. So unusual kinds of inflorescences that if you present one of these families, you should definitely say something about. Again, other kinds of specialized inflorescences just mentioned here. This 
is a very unusual one, the Siathium, and that's in the um, U4BACE. The, especially in the genus Euphorbia, things like poinsettia have this very strange inflorescence. And you've seen poinsettias all your life, but now in this class you'll learn a little bit about them. We have in, remember I talked about the inflorescence of inflorescences in the Asteraceae. And these are those inflorescences that look like flowers. And then over here in the grass family, the Poaceae. We have, again, very complex kinds of flowers and inflorescences. And I'm going to uh, say I leave all of these details to you who present these different families. Just be aware that you should look at the structure of the inflorescences or look for notes in, when you present a family and see if there's anything special about the inflorescence. And if there is, you should say something about it. Okay, we're going to turn to the fruit. The fruit is just the mature ovary. We said already the ovary turns into the fruit and the ovule turns into the seed. So we have in our diagrams here, so here is the ovary of a plant. Here is the ovules. Those ovules are going to turn into the seeds. And that ovary is going to turn into the fruit. Okay, so it changes its form. It looks a little different. Um, and an embryo develops within that ovule after fertilization. But the two structures turn into each other. Fruit, in, fruit comes from the ovary. Seed comes from the ovule. There's two basic types of fruits. And those are simple fruits. and complex, or sometimes called compound, fruits. And within the compound fruits, there are two types, aggregate and multiple. We'll go through these um, one at a time and look at our, first of all, at the simple fruits. So the simple fruits where we have a single flower. So here are a number of different kinds of simple fruits. Now, fruit structure is pretty complex, and the fruit terminology is pretty complex. Not as bad as inflorescence terminology, but it can get pretty bad. We're going to try to keep it very simple by talking about whether the, whether the fruit is fleshy or dry. These fruits are dry. And whehr they open or not. So dehiscent means to open and in means not. So not open. These are fruits that are dry and not opening. And the one that you know the best is, just skip that term and call it a grain here, are things like a corn kernel or a rice, a rice grain. And now I mean whole grain rice here, not the um, white rice. White rice is something different. It's not the um, it's not the full fruit, but whole grain rice is the full fruit, and you, those kinds of things you've known all their life, and they're called grains. And uh, the technical name for that type of fruit is the grain. To understand that kind of fruit, it really helps to contrast it with this other kind of fruit called an akene, and you know this from a sunflower. So, uh, you know, I'm going to call these sunflower seeds, but they're not really seeds. So if you take a sunflower and, you know, you get a sunflower kernels. And by a sunflower kernel, I mean that thing that you have to crack open to get the edible part outside. So it's the kind of thing that you would give to your birds in the backyard. You give them sunflower. They're sold as sunflower seeds. They're actually sunflower fruits. That's the whole fruit. And that's my point. That outer coating on the, on the sunflower is called the pericarp peri around, carp fruit. So this is the
So that's the outer hard coating of the f sunflower seed, in quotes, and that's really not a seed. So it's that outer hard fruit wall. That's the pericarp. And then inside that, you have the part that the birds want to eat, or if you like sunflower seeds that you crack open, you spit out that hard part, and you eat the inside, and that is the seed. That's the actual seed in that case. So that's pretty easy to understand, the sunflower kind of seed, fruit. But in the grain, we have the pericarp completely fused to the seed. So in the grain, the pericarp, that equals the ovary wall, So it's completely fused to the seed coat. So the grain is really a fruit that looks like it's a seed because you can't separate the wall of the ovary, the wall of the fruit, from the seed. They're fused together. So that's why you have to do special things to create white rice. You have to get that outer wall off of there. And that's the difference between the whole grain, the whole grain in a grain contains the ovary wall. The white rice is just the inner side. It's, in fact, doesn't even have the embryo there. It's just storage tissue of starch. Rice, white rice is kind of just pure starch. Very little else there except starch. The different types of fruits now of these simple indehiscent fruits are just variations on the are variations on the keen. I don't want you to have to memorize all these different terms. Let's just look at what the differences are. So this one, the utricle, which you're probably not going to see that term at all this semester except on this slide, but you see here there's a big area here between the pericarp and the seed. In the samara, this is the wing is part of the pericarp. So the pericarp is the wing. Here, so the fruit wall has been extended into a wing, and you know this from things like the fruits of maple. And then in a nut, a nut like a walnut, there is a thick, howdy, thick, leathery, hard but leathery pericarp. So if you go to buy a walnut at the store, you get them in a bag of Christmas nuts, for instance, that outer covering on the walnut is part of the ovary wall. So there's various layers of the ovary wall. The outer layers of the ovary wall and those nuts you got at the grocery store have been removed. And then there's an inner part of the ovary wall. You crack open that inner part of the ovary wall and you get the seed on the inside. So nuts are a little more complex than you've known up until this point. So now we're going to turn to simple dry still, but now dehiscent fruits, fruits that open up. There's three kinds shown on here. The kind that is most important to us is this kind, the legume. It is the kind of fruit we find in the bean family. The legume is a fruit that opens up on two sides. There's two lines of dehiscence, of opening here, and so it flies open into these two valves. So you don't often see that, that it does that in our beans from the store because those are not mature fruits. Those are still very young fruits, and they're not, the seeds are not mature. But if you let them mature, especially if you look at the wild species, they will open like this here. So a legume is a single carpal, and it opens in two sides like this. A follicle is again one carpal, but it only opens on one side, opens along one line, one line of dehiscence. And then a silique, I'm gonna leave till later. 
Sleek and silical, they're essentially the same. They just differ because one's long and thin and one's short and squat. Otherwise, they're the same like this. And um, this is going to be one of the fruits of a family, which we'll do later in the later in the later in the semester. A few more simple dehiscent fruits. Looks like a very complex slide. Let's try to simplify it. Mainly we're going to look at the on the top what we've got are forms of capsules. So these on the top we're just going to all call capsules. Capsules. Different types of capsules. And how do they differ from each other? They differ in the way that they open. So a capsule is just a dry dehiscent fruit that is more than one carpal. It's the difference between a legume and a follicle and a capsule. The follicle, legume, those are one carpal. These are more than one carpal. You can see that here. Here we have one with three locules. And they open in different ways. And you don't need to memorize what those ways are. Some of these ways are typical for certain families, like here we have a very typical way of opening for the family Malvaceae. And I don't think I know a capsule that opens by pores like that except in that Malvaceae. And that, in fact, is poppy, the opium poppy, opens um, and sheds its seed in that way. Down below, there is no real name that unites all of these. We're just going to call them schizo, S-C-H-I-Z-O, schizo fruits, a made-up name by me. Schizo means opening, opening or splitting. So there are fruits that split in different ways. So again, we're going to find these in different families. So there's here, there's three different families, and I'm not even going to list them right now. Um, if you f find out when you're doing your family that there's something special about the fruits, do pause a bit in your presentations and talk about those special kinds of features. And you'll find these different kinds of splitting fruits in some of the families, very characteristic for some families. OK, we've looked at dry fruits, and we've seen essentially three kinds. The follicle, the legume, and the capsule. Well, four kinds if we include the schizo fruits, the splitting fruits, four kinds. Now we're going to look at fleshy fruits. Simple fleshy fruits. Fleshy fruits are basically all indehiscent fruits. They're, they get opened up because an animal comes and eats them, eats the flesh. We are going to call all of the simple fleshy fruits berries. So all of these types of terms that we've got down here, droop, people, hesperinium, poem, are really all just variations on ver berries. And they occur in different specific families. For instance, the um, people in the cucurbitaceae, in the melon family, the pumpkin family, the hesperidium in a family we're not going to do in the family of oranges. It looks kind of like an orange there, doesn't it? The rutaceae. It's a tropical family, which is why we don't do it. The poem in a specific genus, the genus Malus, the apple genus of the family rosaceae. And the droop in, again, very common in the rosaceae in many other of the genera except for malus. So here's the basic idea of the berry. It's just got a fleshy pericarp. So we can divide that pericarp up into different parts, but that's the basic idea, a fleshy pericarp and usually indehiscent. This brings us to our complex or compound fruits. 
and the first type of those are aggregate, aggregate fruits which come from one flower. So there are one flower but there are many, let's just say more than one, pistils. Or we could also say more than one carpal on this. Do not worry about these terms. I don't think you're going to see these terms anywhere except on this slide ever. I've never seen them before. The different, so don't at all worry about those. Just be able to know that these are aggregate fruits and there's different kinds. So perhaps the easiest one are things like the blackberry or the raspberry. So if you look at a raspberry or a blackberry, and you can remember picking them perhaps, you know that you've got a little stem and if you looked at the top of that, you would see the calyx, and you plop that raspberry off. And if you look underneath it, there's a little hole. That hole was where the receptacle was. Each of these, let me grab another color here. So each of these is one carpal, one pistol. So I'm going to say one free carpal, so one pistol. And each of those carpals then has a fleshy outer covering and there's a seed inside. But they're all held together in that little berry. Now it's not a berry like we've talked about already. There's called, this is the colloquial use of the term berry. So all of these individual free carpels are held together in one aggregate fruit. The strawberry is the same basic idea except now the sweet juicy part is what we eat. We eat the receptacle in the strawberry. And these little dots, remember those little black dots on the top of the... I'll just say black dots. Those are the carpels or the pistols. So we've got multiple carpels, multiple pistols. And here is one that's been pulled out. And you can see each one has a pericarp around it. And then on the inside there is the seed. So each one of those is a little fruit. But they're all held together by that big receptacle. So it's not a simple fruit, it's called an aggregate fruit. Over here on the far side, we see the same kind of idea, an aggregate fruit, but now the unit is the follicle. And you've seen these in magnolias. For instance, there's magnolias right outside of our building, and there you see the individual follicle opening along one line, all held together within a receptacle at the center, so there would be a receptacle here at the center holding all those follicles together. Another kind of aggregate fruit. Multiple fruits. Multiple fruits are another kind of complex fruit. In this case we have really an inflorescence. So it's a fruit made out of an inflorescence, which means there's more than one flower. Simplest case to look at that is here in the pineapple. So 
So in the pineapple, we have those little hexagonal sections of the fruit, and those are each individual flowers. This will be easier when you have a pineapple in front of you. Here is the margin of one of those parts of the, f the fruit, those hexagonal areas. Here's those same margins shown over here. And this area here, that is all the ovary. In other words, a fruit. So each of those areas that I've highlighted or outlined in red is an ovary and taken together, all stuck together, we have a multiple fruit, a fruit composed of many individual flowers. We'll look at that in lab so you can see it better. In other groups here, here's a, the genus Platinus in the, gen, in the family Platagenaceae, which you'll do later on, and it has, again, multiple flowers. There's one flower stuck together in an inflorescence which has now matured so that each flower becomes a fruit but the fruits are all stuck together so it is a multiple fruit. We won't go into fig again. Remember I said that fig, this is in the Moraceae. If you're covering the Moraceae, you can go over fruit structure there. And Xanthium is not a genus we're going to do here but again it's got the same idea it's got multiple flowers stuck together to form a multiple fruit. Well, that's the review for today of basic reproductive terminology. Just like for vegetative terminology, you should be familiar with these terms so that you can use them if you encounter them.